tonight. And as everyone knows, uh, this is an extraordinarily important time for the Chesterfield County Schools. And we have uh, great candidates here this evening. And I just want to talk a little bit first about how, we're going, how the evening is going to proceed. We're going to start with a 90-second introduction from each candidate. Later on, we'll have 60 seconds for a closing statement. Overall, there'll be five what we call full-length questions, with three districts responding to each question. So the questions will rotate evenly between the districts, so each district will answer a total of three questions, and each candidate will get one minute to answer that question. We've asked the candidates to remember it's a forum, not a debate, and we're, we're asking them to refrain from uh, confronting the person next to them verbally and or physically. <laughs> Each candidate is also allotted one wild card. So if the candidate hears a question that is not addressed to their district, but they have a burning desire to answer it, at the end of each set of questions, I'll ask if anybody would like to use their wild card, and they have the opportunity to do that. After those five questions, we're going to have what we call a short lightning round, where we'll have three questions where I'll ask for either a yes or no answer or an answer that can be uh, presented within 15 seconds of each candidate. Uh, after that, there'll be a couple of questions in which we'll ask every candidate on the stage to answer within 30 seconds. And then finally, we should have some time for questions from the audience. Uh, the chamber and the observer are going to collect them. They're going to try to make sure that they're uh, targeted toward the, uh, the general question and not toward any particular candidate as well. So uh, that's what we'll do. We're going to have a wonderful evening. We should be taking about uh, two hours total uh, for the event. And we're going to begin with the opening statement. We're going to ask Patrick Reed from Midlothian to begin. Patrick? Yeah, we're going to, we're going to ask everybody to pass the mics. And uh, as they told me, there's a button to push. Is everybody heard Great. Uh, good evening. My name is Patrick Reed. I'm asking to be your Midlothian School Board representative. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself by telling a story about my background. My freshman year of college, I was a walk-on to the University of Richmond's football team. And two weeks into that season, our country was attacked on 9-11. I remember at practice that afternoon, one of our coaches was taking us in and telling us, hey, no matter what's going on in the world, we need to focus on what's important. And that's the game we have on Saturday. That didn't sit well with me, just like I know it doesn't sit well with you in Europe right now. So I quit the football team, joined the Army ROTC program, completion of my College degree, was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Army, did my law degree, served on eight years back in the United States Army, including tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. We need real leaders on our school board, ladies and gentlemen. I believe in my practical, relevant experience as a leader in our community as a youth lacrosse coach, a trial attorney, and a major in the U.S. Army Reserve to be an asset to the school board to make sure we get things moving on track with consistent quality services. Thank you. Our second candidate is Catherine Haynes from Midlothian. And if anybody wants to remain seated, you can do that as well. <laughs> yeah. No, just keep this on now. Okay. Hi. I am Catherine Haynes. My neighbors asked me to run for school board, and I said yes. I said yes because my lifetime has been committed to community building and public service. And that started when my first school was when my now 16-year-old entered a pre-K, public pre-K program in Washington, D.C. I said yes because I have a master's degree in urban planning and policy, and policy making is the number one job of a school board member. I have used my policy making skills already in Chesterfield County to support our students who speak English as the second language and increase access, and also to increase access to our gifted programs. I said yes because I have four kids, I have kids at the elementary, middle, and high school level. I have a kid who receives special education services. I've been in the center-based gifted program. I have a kid who loves school and hates school. So I'm pretty sure that I can connect with somebody like you. And it is creating these connections that will build a stronger community together. It takes work. It's not just about me. Move to uh, Denisha Ponce from Otoa. Well, I think I'll be the first candidate to, candidate to remain seated. Uh, my name is Denisha Potts. I am the candidate for the Matoa District School Board. I 
have uh, a degree, a bachelor's in science, in therapy of aggregation, and a master's in healthcare administration. I am cur I'm currently employed by the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. I also have a, uh, been a volunteer for an extensive amount of time, years, uh, here in Chesterfield County. I am currently serving my third year on the Chesterfield County Schools Equity Committee. I have formerly served as the two-term vice president of the Chesterfield NAACP and education chair. My role with the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services is a policy review specialist. I think with my uh, community, community involvement and uh, my activism in the community, not only for your students, your families, and your teachers, I think that will be an asset to our board, someone who has reached across the aisles with our state legislators, as well as our current board members is imperative. I also know the importance, and I have also partnered with other organizations in order to get the needs met of our current students in our school. I believe in fostering partnerships, and I believe in building relationships. I would like for you to continue to, uh, is that my time? Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Ryan Carter. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ryan Carter, and I'm also running for the Utopia seat on the Chesterfield County School Board. As a teacher in our school system, I've seen what happens in a classroom day in and day out. Uh, the relationships you make with students and other faculties, and really see how the school functions as a whole. As a parent of four children in our school, one in high school, two in middle school, and one in elementary school, sometimes I share a lot of your guys' frustrations, whether it be from transportation, um, could be from school safety standpoints, um, or even just some of the curriculum that's going on in school. Um, so I'm trying to keep the schools moving in the right direction. All of our schools are accredited. For a large school system, that does speak volumes. But there are things that we need to fix. Our transportation, we need to make sure that we have an effective budget that tackles maintenance concerns, a budget that takes care of our teachers, our paraprofessionals, our bus drivers. And we need to make sure that our schools have the most uh, security conscious devices uh, in place, making sure that we're able to see entrances in and out of the schools, making sure that we're able to keep people from coming in and out of the schools that should be there. Um, I plan to work with the Board of Supervisors and state legislators to make sure that we can keep moving our schools in the right direction. Thank you. We're going to move to the Dale District now, Shedrick McCall. How are you doing? My name is Dr. Shedrick McCall. Uh, I have a uh, bachelor's in psychology, I have a master's in counseling, and I have a doctorate in counseling psychology and education. I'm a counseling psychologist. I currently teach at Virginia State University, where I'm an associate professor of psychology, where I've been for 15 years. And I've been in education for over 15 years. Uh, my wife, Dr. Shannon McCall, is in education also. And I have a son, Shannon McCall, the third, that matriculated through Dale Schools. Uh, he matriculated through Dale Schools. And he graduated from the L.C. Bird in 2017. And he's currently attending Virginia State University. And he's a junior psychology major, following in my footsteps prayerfully. And um, as you can see, education is very important to me, as you know, as my family has a lot of education, and I've been in education for over 25 years. The reason that I decided to run is I want to be a change agent. I want to be a voice from, from the community and the students to the school board, and I just want to do a good job, and I believe that I will work hard, I will represent the constituents, and I will be a, a good team player as I play college football, so I enjoy sports, I enjoy getting along with others. I think that I have an amicable personality, uh, as again, I get along with others, and I just want to make a change and make a difference in our school systems. And I look forward to you all voting for me on November the 5th. Thank you so much. Okay. Debbie Bailey. Hi, I'm Debbie Bailey, and I'm running for the Dale District. I'd like to thank the Chamber and the Observers for this opportunity to let the voters know that I am the most qualified candidate due to my 34 years of teaching all in Chesterfield County Schools. I'm a product of Chesterfield County Schools. 
My husband and I, after college, decided to raise our children here. We have two children, Sarah and Jake, and it's my role as Sarah's mother that makes me uniquely qualified for this position, as she has cerebral palsy and has spent her life in a wheelchair. I fought the battles that many families fight when raising a special needs child. I worked to ensure that Sarah and all students had opportunities and resources that they could access. As a board member though, my first priority would be to bring some finality to the transportation and maintenance issues so that we can get back to the business of education. I want to focus on students and learning, not maintenance and transportation. I want to transition away from high stakes SOL tests to a growth based model of assessment so we can return to more learning in our classrooms and less testing. I want to empower our teachers to be creative and have the autonomy to take back their classrooms. We need to embrace our teachers and support them and that begins with raising teacher salaries to the national average. I was humbled and honored to be named the 2015 Middle School Teacher of the Year, but we have many fabulous teachers that we need to support. Thank you, and I look forward to tonight's discussion. Thank you, Luke Clover Hill and Justin Smith. Hello, my name is Justin Smith. Uh, I was born and raised right here in Chesterfield County. Um, my mom taught in Chesterfield. Uh, she's actually a retired Chesterfield County teacher. Um, I'm running for school board because my education and my career makes me uniquely qualified for this position. Prior to my career in law and public policy, I worked in construction. I understand why we need to make why we need to uh, work on maintenance to make sure we're paying as we go, so we don't incur large costs later on. Uh, once I moved into the uh, law and public policy, I've spent a better part of a decade in. Um, I uh, I worked at the BRS, uh, and there I was their program manager for appeals. Uh, I'm intimately familiar with the retirement system that most of our teachers are invested in, that I myself invested in. I worked there with the board that uh, was in charge of um, maintaining a $72 billion retirement fund. Uh, I've worked with boards, I've worked with large budgets. Um, currently I work in IT for the Department of Medical Assistance Services, so I understand the need for uh, the technical resources for our students and what's going to make them valuable in the workforce if that's the direction they need to go. But most of our jobs are headed in that direction. We need to make sure that we're educating our children for once they leave the Chesterfield school system. Most importantly, I'm a father. I have three kids, two are in the school system right now, and uh, I coach my son's rugby team. Um, family is very important to me, and I want to do the best for our children. And I look forward to for our conversation this evening. Thanks. Eric Phillips. Good evening. My name is Erica Phillips, and I am running for school board in the Clover Hill District. I am running because I believe that every child should receive an equitable education. What that means is that they should not be educated based on their race, their religion, their social economic status, their sexual orientation, their zip code. None of those things should affect the education they receive. I believe that children should be educated based on their talents, their needs, their abilities, and goals. I believe that I am the most qualified candidate based on the fact that I have a undergraduate degree in education, a master's in nonprofit studies, which includes public policy and fiscal management and budgeting. I have been a part of the Clover Hill community since I was a child. I grew up in Chesterfield. My children are being raised in Chesterfield. I have one child who has graduated from Chesterfield schools, and I have a child who has special needs. During that fight of getting her the services that she need, needed, I learned a lot, and I realized that families needed people to advocate for them. My husband and I started a nonprofit in Chesterfield, which is in the schools, and we provide tutoring, homework help, life skills, and multiple resources for families. I'm running because I believe in our community and I believe that everyone should have a voice. Thank you. Dot Heffron. Good evening. I'm Dot Heffron and I am also running for the Clover Hill seat on the Chesterfield School Board. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in Chesterfield County um, in the Clover Hill District, as a matter of fact. Um, I graduated from Monaghan, class of 1994. 
And together with my husband of 19 years, we are raising our three wonderful children, all of whom attend the same schools I did when I grew up. Uh, I taught at Providence Middle School. I taught so as a tutor, um, helping other students who were learning English as a foreign language. And I am proud to have served our community as the chair of the Special Education Advisory Committee. The SEAC acts as a liaison between families of children who receive special education services and the school board itself. I'm also proud to say that I have been endorsed by the Chesterfield Education Association as well as the Richmond Association of Realtors. Both of these professional organizations recognize that my vision for our county of supporting our teachers as well as um, providing the resources that are necessary for every child to succeed in every corner of our county benefit our community as a whole. I have a long track record of public service and I am running, <laughs> I am running to, to have the opportunity to continue my commitment to our community and to give back to the community that has given so much to me and my family. Thank you. Move to the Bermuda District, Ann Coker. Good evening. I'm Ann Coker and thank you all for having us here this evening. My experience in life, and as well as uh, work and interaction with the CCPS school system, is why voters should have trust in me, put their trust in me, to be the next Bermuda District School Board representative. I've lived in Chesterfield County my entire life. Um, I am a product of Chesterfield County Schools, graduated from Thomas Dale in 1993. My husband, Jason, is a firefighter, and we have four wonderful children who all attend um, Chesterfield County Schools, one in high school, middle school, and two in elementary school. I have a parent's perspective of our schools, and I will be able to um, relate to their concerns. As the Vice President and President of Enon Elementary CTO, I have a first-hand understanding and working with parents, as well as hearing teachers' concerns and um, fostering relationships with our community so that I can be the best representative for the district. I'm also involved in our local church and scouting and in my career as an um, excuse me, <laughs> accounting manager at ITAC, which is an engineering and construction company. I work with budgets on a daily basis. I know how to manage, how to um, make sure that we're staying within budget and that we're being accountable for our budget. I also create processes and procedures for our company on a daily basis. I will bring my um, work experience, my problem solving skills to the school board, and I thank you for your time. Will Ayers. Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Will Ayers, and I'm running for the Bermuda School Board seat. Uh, I'm a product of Chester County Schools. I grew up right here in this district. Um, I have been in this building many times. Um, I have four younger siblings. Um, we all are a product of, of Chesterfield County. Um, I graduated from Thomas Dale in 2015. And so I believe that I have a um, unique perspective on the school board as somebody who recently graduated. Um, I have an uh, ornate ability to describe how, um, sorry, uh, sorry. As a product of the schools, I have been there, I lived it, I saw it but also through my involvement with um, local nonprofit organizations, sitting on the board of directors for the Chester YMCA, um, and being um, an active member of the community, I think that I have what it takes to make sure that the county moves in the right direction. Our teachers need better pay, our bus drivers need proper incentives to stay in the county. Um, we need to move away from um, standardized, test standardized testing, um, and I, I think the evidence is there that shows that if we find um, a board that will work well with our board of supervisors. Um, we can accomplish so many things that the county is looking forward to. Um, I can't wait to have this discussion with you, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks very much. So we're now going to move to the first question. We're going to start with Tonka <coughs> and Ryan Carter, and then we're going to move after we, um, after Matoka to Bermuda and Clover Hill with this question. Uh, the number of students from low income families is increasing. Uh, with more and more students on free and reduced price lunch. Research has shown that year-round schools, such as Bellwood and Pollen Creek Elementary, can lead to improved academic progress for lower income students. Would you support expanding the year-round calendar to all Title I schools? And Ryan, you're first. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, it's an interesting question because uh, I see it from both sides. 
and there is a benefit to that, especially with low-income uh, families, with keeping those students in school year-round, having those short breaks. That also helps with, with teacher burnout, also. Um, I would be cautious of fully implementing it without taking a look at all the statistics over a three- or four-year period. See, really, how did the schools perform? What does the data show? And also, how did the community respond to it? And if the community responds positively to it, I would have no problem opening that up to ask the rest of the community if it's something that they would like to consider. But I think that's something that um, the community should have to input. Okay. Denisha? Yes, um, I think with all things taken into consideration, we definitely need to look at the benefits as well as the disadvantages. Um, I feel as though we need to do some things that are different in our processes and think a little bit outside of the box. I would be willing to support year-round schools. I think it offers advantages, such as our teachers being able to uh, receive income year-round. In addition to it, it would also help a lot of our families who have social or economic issues. It also would be an asset for our community to um, encourage uh, our students' uh, learning abilities, uh, especially when we're looking at our reading test scores. So it is definitely something that I am open to uh, due to the advantages, but we definitely need to look at the data. Thank you. And COVID. I too um, would support exploring the uh, year-round school possibility. Um, I think it is important that we uh, talk with the, the public and make sure that any concerns um, regarding year-round schools would be addressed and make sure that we have all of the research and information um, in front of us before we made um, such a, a change. Um, also, um, I believe that rollout is key and how we roll out uh, changing to a year-round school system. As a parent, I understand that would be a very um, critical change to our uh, family life, so making sure that we have the best rollout procedure in place would be key. But there are many pros um, regarding year-round schools, um, based on the research I've seen so far, um, regarding summer slide, um, overcrowding, um, those, those items as well. But again, it was something that we would definitely need to take to the public and make sure that everyone is on board. Will Harris. I think uh, it's incredibly important to remember the representatives, and I think that um, it would really depend on what the Bermuda district voters wanted from us. Um, there is a plethora of great data on it. Um, we've seen test scores increase, uh, reading levels were brought back up to standards. Um, child care for a lot of parents, um, free and reduced lunch for a lot of um, families with socioeconomic um, downfalls. Uh, so there are many positives to it, but it needs to be something that the entire county or the entire district is uh, in agreement on. It needs to be something that's gonna benefit everyone. Um, so I think that um, I agree with and uh, communication is absolutely key, making sure that everyone uh, knows well in advance and, and has ample time to talk about it. It's important. Thank you. Justin, it's great. Um, this is something where you have, absolutely have to have community buy-in, but that human community also involves your administration and your teachers. Uh, we've implemented this in uh, several schools here in Chesterfield, and in the ones we did, we lost double-digit teachers. A lot of teachers are dependent on that summer vacation because uh, they work second jobs, because we don't pay our teachers enough to be able to work just a teacher job year round. Um, I do think it's something where there are a lot of pros. You know, you get rid of that summer slide. It is something where uh, it can help with the cost of child care, um, care for uh, parents who have, uh, you know, both of them are working. Um, but it's something that we have to take by a school by school basis, and then there's a negative impacts there. Some parents are dependent on their older child to take care of their younger child when they're not home. And so now if you have different schools that are in different times and uh, one year round and the other one isn't, you may have taken away their health care, or sorry, their child care, because the older student now is on a, a different schedule and they're not there to watch the younger siblings. So it could increase costs. 
I think there's a lot of pro and cons, but it's something we definitely have to have buy-in from the public, and I'd like to see about a 70% approval from the public in that area. Erica Phillips. Um, I, I definitely believe that year-round schooling is beneficial. I believe that it can close the teeth and gap that we're seeing um, for our students of color and our students that are in a lower social economic um, family. But I do think that the community does have to have a value. And so as we've been doing it with one school at a time, if we can continue on that path, I think that the community will support it if it's needed. Dr. <coughs> Heffern. Uh, I support data-driven decision-making, um, and I think that we really need to look at the numbers that come back um, from, the, from the schools that we've already rolled out. Um, this is not a cheap proposition. It's a um, definite expense to the schools, an added expense to the schools for year-round schools, and we need to find where that money is going to come from before we continue to implement this um, on a wide scale for all of our Title I schools. Um, and that being said, I'm going to echo some sentiments that have already been mentioned. Um, that policy changes need to be made with the community, not for the community. And the, this discussion about year-round school has a, a very serious impact on our families and our teachers uh, in the school system. And I don't think, uh, I, as, as a school board representative, I would not be comfortable making that decision unilaterally. Would anybody want to use their wild card for this question? Okay, we're going to go to question two now. Then we're going to start with Dale and Debbie Graves. Then we're going to go to Midlothian and Matoa. Um, the school system's recent struggles with transportation are well documented. Buses in some parts of the county are still arriving late to school, and there remains a significant bus driver shortage. How would you go about fixing the school system's <coughs> transportation issues? Nothing wrecks a teacher's morning more than late buses. When you hear on the morning announcement the string of bus numbers that are arriving late and you're looking at a class that's half full and you spent the entire evening planning this great lesson, it's all of a sudden ruined. Not to mention the young elementary school children whose young mother is standing at a bus stop in the afternoon, and the bus isn't there when it's supposed to be. It's devastating to families that this transportation issue is, has become so significant. The solution is to find more bus drivers. If anybody out there wants to drive a bus, there are 53 drivers applications we need right now. We need more bus drivers. We have a bus driver <coughs> shortage because we don't pay them enough. They get paid approximately $14 an hour. The national average is $17 an hour. I hate to say it, but it's a money issue. Pay them, they will come. Sugar call. Debt is a big issue, <coughs> excuse me, in Chesterfield County. I think that um, it's very significant with that. He is getting picked up late, uh, but our kids getting dropped off late. That's a real concern for our parents and uh, constituents in the community, and it's definitely a safety issue. Uh, one of the things that I definitely would look at uh, is that there need to be bus driver staffs so that we can get more people in and want to be bus drivers. We definitely need to increase bus drivers' pay. Uh, one of the things in Chesterfield County that has been discussed is that our bus drivers go through a large training, and that training costs a lot. But what happens at the end, once they complete the training, they're able to go to another school system and make more money. So we need to also look at giving our bus drivers maybe a year contract. So after we train them, then we can keep them at least for a year. I think this is a very critical issue that we need to get the families and the community involved in and talk about the transportation because it's definitely a safety issue for our children in the community. Thank you. Catherine Haynes. Uh, Mendozian folks have noticed that we're uh, not getting the microphone. Um, so I agree with my colleagues that believe in raising the salary for bus drivers. In 2017, I was at a start time meeting and Dr. Lane said that bus driver salaries needed to be raised for uh, the start time change plan to succeed. Um, that didn't happen. I attend Citizen Budget Advisory Council meetings. I'm doing that for a year. Um, 
the budget uh, recommendations for 2019 uh, were to raise uh, bus driver salaries. That was one of the four priorities that were put forth. Uh, that uh, did not happen. Um, so we need to do it. It's a market problem. We need a market solution. Uh, we also need to respect our bus drivers, so not changing routes uh, last minute without proper communication. And uh, I'm hearing from our bus drivers that they need uh, more behavioral support on the bus. Uh, so that they can focus on driving, and so we need to solve that problem as well. Thank you. Patrick Reagan. Thank you. I don't believe our transportation problems can be solved by banking on the job market whether it goes up or down. We need multiple solutions that are not dependent on how our economy is based. I believe our bus drivers should be paid a fair salary, but if our economy gets better, we have triple hiring in two more years, we can solve any problems. We need to come up with solutions that are going to eliminate routes since we're constantly asking for more bus drivers. I believe that we need to have practical solutions like working with our supervisors, have sidewalks put into those neighborhoods that are closest to the school to develop walk zones that are acceptable for our parents and kids to walk to school without the need of hoping for a bus driver to be hired. We have kids that ride a bus for 30 minutes around the whole neighborhood and then get dropped off when they're in front, they live in front of the elementary school. That is not a responsible solution. We need to have practical solutions to this problem. Denisha Thomas. The ongoing transportation issue has been going on far too long. Uh, this we, year after year, we have to deal with the same issue. We have to aggressively uh, take action in ensuring that our students are being picked up and dropped off safely. Uh, according to the, our director of transportation, our current uh, director of transportation, Calvin Fry. He reported last that 21% of our students are still arriving late to less than 10% before the hour instructional bell or later in the morning. Bus driver shortage is 50% higher than last year, and an average of 14 drivers are absent every day. This is an issue. Folks, this is what I believe we need to do. We need to focus on recruitment and retention. We also need to, as I agree with the, the other board member or the candidates, we need to look at increasing bus salaries in addition to referral fees okay. and Thank bonuses. You. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Hart. <clears throat> so, almost every day this year, my children have picked up late from school buses. Sometimes it's 10 minutes, sometimes it's up to 30 minutes, and then the same way coming home. Um, this is a systemic issue. Um, we need to find a way to increase the morale of bus drivers in the transportation department. We need to find a way to pay them a little bit more, and we need to find effective ways to retain bus drivers. And I think all three of those things are important to ensure that we, um, that we can keep the bus drivers and that we can attract good talent from other places. I think Patrick had a very good point with walk zones. Um, I see the same thing too. I see bus stops directly across the street from the school. Um, if there are safe places with sidewalks where this could be uh, initiated, I think it's something to take a look at. If we could alleviate just a few routes, it's something worthwhile for us to take a look at. And of course, it would have to be something that we can get some community buy-in from, because we do not want to act unless we have the support of people. Does anyone want to use their wild card for this question? Will first, then Jeff. So, um, I've been following this issue now for close to two years. Um, I think a lot of the problem is teacher or bus driver pay, yes. Um, but I think that we need to take a much bigger look into how the community um, deals with transportation. Currently, the Bermuda District does not have a single CBG center. And so center-based gifted programs are not offered in this end of the county. And so when you send your child and, and, um, to a center-based gifted program, they're often sent to another part, um, to either the Dale District or Clover Hall District or whatever. So not only is that an issue because it's, um, if, you, if mom and dad both work jobs and can't pick their child up from school after school, um, it, it's much farther travel time. So we're relying on buses to send our kids twice as far um, when we already have a bus shortage. So we need to start by looking at what, what programs we can offer within our own districts to mitigate some of the tra uh, travel time between um, districts. Um, we, we are currently on a bus lease. We are almost out of it. I think it's crucial that the county takes a serious look at the budget and 
figures out how we can purchase our own buses, um, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Justin, so transportation is really one of the main issues that I'm running. Um, and as a matter of fact, earlier this week, my wife called me in a panic uh, because we hadn't heard from the school. Our children were not home. We hadn't heard from their bus. Uh, she you know, called me immediately. I left the meeting at work to, to give her a call. The bus showed up. Later, it was a different bus number. We had a substitute bus driver, but it, it wasn't communicated. Um, it's not just the lack of bus drivers. It is the lack of communication. We have a software that we uh, bought initially in Chesterfield County to help us with routing. It ended up taking a $60,000 bath because it wasn't something that was big enough or it wouldn't work for accounting the stocks. Um, I think we need to make smarter decisions when looking at what we're doing um, with the transportation. And then it's not just the number of bus drivers, but it's also the types of contracts. We have contracts for bus drivers who work eight hours a day and we have six hours a day. So if we increase the number of hours that bus drivers can work, I think that would help reduce the number of bus drivers we need. We have kids who can't go on field trips because they don't have a bus driver to take them because they're at the end of their contract hours. Anyone else want to use the last part of that question? All right, the next question will go first to Clover Hill and Erica Phillips, then to Bermuda and then Dale. After the school shooting two years ago that left 17 dead in Parkland, the school board convened the safety task force committee, which issued a list of recommendations for improving school safety last fall. If several of the recommendations, such as infrastructure improvements, and adding mental health support staff have not yet been implemented. What would you do to improve school safety? I think the first thing that we need to look at is the support staff that we have in our schools. One of the things that has been a very hot topic is whether we should have guns in the schools. If we provide, provide the right professionals, such as the right ratios for students to counselors, students to psychologists, students to social workers. That would really start us off to provide a safer environment for our students. So we need to look at how we're spending our money as far as staff versus adding in other things first. So I believe the staffing is the issue. John um, I also agree that we need to increase our support staff to our schools. Um, we need to, it's imperative that we implement the 1 to 250 uh, counselor to student ratio for our, um, our, our school counselors. Um, and we need to have more support for social emotional learning programs. Because when we look at root cause, um, we really need to build, look at the, the culture that we're building in our schools. Now we have 25, that being said, we have $25 million of unfunded safety needs in our schools. So those safety needs, those lists of safety needs that were mentioned earlier, um, that includes locks on doors, um, upgraded locks on doors, um, up, upgraded doorknobs, and a unified uh, closed caption uh, or, or closed circuit television system. Um, these, are, these are easily attainable and they need to be made priorities. Justin Smith. So I think for school safety, really we need to build a sense of community with our children. If everybody is uh, talking to each other, they feel safe, they have that opportunity to talk to each other, um, and you build that sense of community, I think you're, you're going to have less of those children who feel like they're left out and have something to uh, prove as far as um, you know, wanting to, to harm somebody. Um, the mental health support staff is, I think, a big part of that. You know, we need to get to that 250 students to one uh, ratio. And that's just the minimum. I think that's what the state says, uh, recommends, but we could possibly do better than that. You know, it's a budget issue. We have to make sure that as a school board, we are judicious with our funds. Um, SROs is something that has been uh, recommended, and I think it's a good starting point, but we have to take a look at that return on investment. If a door lock or a different door barrier would give us a, a longer return on investment. Uh, key cards or double door entry foyers, that might be something worth exploring first. Thanks. Will Harris. Um, so uh, I sat at many of those meetings. Um, I think um, one important thing to note is that the Chief of Police for Chesterfield County specifically went on record and said that we are short police officers in Chesterfield County 
Chester Road County Public Schools needs to look into uh, mental health support services before asking for armed mentors or armed officers in our schools. Um, I think that being at that, the, the national um, recommended average of 251 is not only crucial, um, but it is necessary um, to even be lower. I, there is no reason why we cannot, while we're telling our children that we cannot afford to give them more time with somebody who's going to help them in the long run. Um, even if it's just college prep or career help. Uh, we, when I was at Thomas Dale, um, I had my counselor had 450 students. I saw her one time in one year. And cover. I agree. We need to look at increasing our mental health support in our school systems. I do know as a parent, my um, children come home and talk to me about their morning meetings, which I think is a really positive way for our students to start their morning. They have several times when they get to talk about things that are going on in their life and what kind of mood that they're in particularly so that the teacher gets to engage with them and understand how they're feeling and know okay well johnny had a rough night the night before so it's that to me is also a part of mental health and a part of understanding how the student is feeling um, i also agree that we need to look at um, looking at ways to implement safety measures like double locking doors like we have in um, many schools um, as well as any other um, safety measures that we can implement. Um, and that's what I would, would want to explore um, as a school board representative. I think this definitely is an uh, issue that we need to address. I am a counselor psychologist and I deal with children that exhibit trauma on a daily basis, something that is disturbing and distressing to them. Some of the reasons that when we look at school safety, you have bullying, you have gangs in school, you have kids that can't afford certain clothes and they have people pick on them. And then what happens when these kids are picked on, they don't have the resources within their self to make cognitive, important decisions. And that's why we need more mental health individuals in the school system. As I said, I am a psychologist and I've dealt with this. I had a young man not long ago, uh, uh, last Friday, matter of fact, dealing with uh, being bullied in gangs and things like that in school. And unfortunately, he was shot seven times and killed. This is something that we definitely need to look at because school safety is definitely important. Because you send your kids to school for an education, you don't send them there to potentially get hurt or harmed. So this is something that I'm running on, and this is a part of my platform, and I think that mental health is critical and crucial for our students in the school. That's Debbie Bell. I remember vividly putting my little five-year-old girl in a wheelchair on a bus to go to school for the first time. And I was terrified. Not that she was going to come home not knowing her ABCs or, or her colors, that she wasn't going to come home safe. And that was before saying the book. I can't imagine being a mother today, putting a young child on a bus to go to school in today's climate. We need to do everything possible to make sure our families feel confident that their children are going to come home to them safe. And that means that we have SROs in every building, and why not SROs in elementary? Are we saying that our elementary school children don't need to be as safe as our middle school and high school children? I support every one of the school safety task force recommendations that they have proposed. They're, they were actually adopted by the state. The county's task force was so um, good in their research that the state has adopted them. And we led the way in that. We need to put them all into play. Does anyone want to use their wild card on this? I'll start with Kathy. Go down the line. Yep. Kathy? Kathy Haynes. Oh. <laughs> um, I think we need to start by being I think we need to not give false reassurances. Uh, the FBI um, and the U.S. Secret Service uh, found that there were red flags in almost all of the cases of active shooters after a combine. Uh, the shooters uh, exhibited four to five concerning behaviors. 
So the, the key to preventing active shooters and keeping our kids safe is prevention. I went to a panel on safety that represented a diverse background of experts of people who were SROs, trained SROs, um, worked with mental health counseling, and with each person when asked what the number one uh, thing that they need or the, the most important focus for safety said relationships, which fits in with a big reason why I'm running and what fuels my campaign, and that is community building. We have uh, a trauma-informed expert, uh, Hans Akru, who said we need 64 counselors, 32 psychologists, 32 social workers, and four trauma care experts. So we'll start with that. Yes, um, I would like to begin by saying that on March the 24th, 2018, I participated in the March on Washington at the Park on the Students up in Washington, D.C. last year. That really was a powerful movement by a group of students, and I listened and I heard them. The other side of this is I do believe we need to secure our schools. But I think there's a better way. We need to address the bullying, which is a part of my platform. The other issue is there are other mechanisms that we can put in place, such as cameras, such as uh, under, uh, under uh, not really, you wouldn't call them undercover in the schools, but I work for state government and our state police are walking around, uh, for the, for some in civilian clothes. I do not think, I think it can look, it's rather threatening when we have school resource officers and tactical gear approaching children with special needs and interrogating them. So we need to look at it from both angles and approach it with the most comprehensive way of addressing the issue to ensure that our schools are safe, but that also our children are not feeling threatened and targeted. Thank you. Ryan Hart. Um, school safety is probably one of the things that's nearest to my heart. Um, and I'm going to agree with a lot of things that everyone has said in here. Definitely, we do need more counselors in school. Some of the things that I've seen at, at the school that I taught at, um, trauma-informed care, teachers were able to um, get training on how to deal with students who maybe having particular issues, and I think that's important, um, that from the inside we're able to see signs of when students are disturbed about something or to just know a little bit more background and build those relationships. Secondly, um, making sure that we have double locks on the doors, making sure that we do have cameras covering every entrance in and out of the school, making sure that there is more communication within the school for teachers to be able to communicate besides just the phone in your room. And finally, the school resource officers, I see that as a mentorship role. Besides when I being there for safety, I have seen uh, resource officers make relationships with students that teachers were not even able to make. And by the end of the year, they would rather go to the SRO than they would rather come to a teacher. So I think we really need to rethink the SRO situation. Anyone else want to use the wild card, Eric? I think the question becomes, who are we protecting? Um, I believe that we're supposed to be educating and protecting all students. And this becomes an equity issue. This becomes, you know, when you're looking at children, minority children, children of color, they are disciplined at a disproportionate rate in Chesterfield County. The statistics show that. And we have children who have experienced trauma and adverse situations. And to see an officer every day, how, how are we affecting those students? Are we protecting the kids from people coming in, or are we protecting the kids from kids, and if we have that as an issue, we have a bigger problem. So we need to look at who we're protecting. Anyone else want to use their mark? Okay. This next question starts off with Midlothian, Patrick Regan, goes to Matoica, and then Clover Hill. The public school system and our community colleges have partnered with businesses on workforce development. If the county still struggles to keep high school graduates in the local workforce, how can we improve the workforce development pipeline? 
at its core, the education system is designed to make sure people have a future in their career field so they can provide for their family, be part of society. We have to make sure kids are leaving with relevant skills, whether it be to go to college or to actually get through a trade. I believe that we need to allow students to have dual enrollment as soon as possible once they identify that they want to participate in dual enrollment. But that also means exposing them to those experiences like we just had with the, the fairs, they can see what's out there. But what I don't support is pushing all kids to the workforce if that's not what they want to do. We need to give kids the option, let them see all the options so we can make sure they have the opportunity to succeed in whatever field they want to have. Catherine Haynes. Um, I think that we need to give our kids options. Uh, I first learned about this problem when my daughter came home as a sophomore and she was hoping to do the culinary program at uh, CTC Hall and realized that she did not have the space in her, in her uh, course schedule. So she was not able to do that. So with good counseling, um, students can sit down and uh, find out what the student's passions are and do this ahead of time. So it's not when they're a sophomore and it's too late, um, but do it early. And just like when we're talking about the specialty centers uh, and making sure that all students are learning about our specialty centers uh, and what changes they might need in order to fit those into their schedule. Um, we also, uh, need to make sure um, that we provide uh, um, that we have people uh, in schools that are telling stories about different options it was interesting when my 16 year old ryan park um so uh patrick pointed out the mission to So mission to tomorrow is a picture. My kids just went on it yesterday. Um, and I've taken classes there. <laughs> I'm going down. So I've taken I've taken classes there before in the past. And I think it's great because they're able to see um, different options that are out there besides for just college. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Fourth one ought to be in charge. Um, however, I don't think that we really push our technical centers and our technical training as much, and there should be as many barriers to get into our tech centers. Um, I had a lot of students who were looking to, they came actually for recommendations when they were looking to get into tech centers, and they had to have a pretty high GPA to get in there. Well, the students that would probably benefit the most and thrive in those situations are not necessarily going to have the best GPA. I think that we need to do a better job at the county of supporting that. Um, the thing when we have people come in for career day, just exposing young people to the different options that are out there and let them know that college is great. And college could be an option, but it's not the only option. Denisha Pop. Yes, I think uh, we, for beginners, I know when I was in school, in high school in the 90s, our school counselors were used as a resource to help us in this area as far as identifying careers that were suited for where we were academically. Uh, what, we're, what our counselors are faced with today, they are being delegated other non-essential tasks that are related to their um, to their employee work profile. So they may have a scheduled lunchroom duty. If we are able to eliminate a lot of those non-counselor responsibilities, then they can assist these students in formulating a career plan. I will in support of our continued specialty centers, as well as our, uh, the, uh, we also have the code RBA. I am in support of that, as well as our specialty centers. Um, I think we also need to make sure that we are incorporating military. Um, we, we still, uh, our students. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to start by saying that I recognize the interdependent relationship between schools and economic development. Um, however, I don't think this is a situation where we could have the tail wagging the dog. Uh, school, students should be choosing their career paths based on uh, capabilities and interests, not on what, uh, they're not employed, employment factories. Um, students should be pursuing their interests in schools. Um, and I, I mean, when I'm on the board, I want to fully, I plan to fully support um, the Virginia Department of Education's profile of graduate five C's that will create students who will be good citizens, who will be good uh, collaborators, 
and creative problem solvers. Because when we focus on these larger soft skills, then we're going to have a workforce that is going to be able to um, to pursue their own passions and um, be an asset to um, the economic community. Justin Smith. So working with the local community is very important here. Um, the CTC is in the Clover Hill District. So we have a, a lot of different opportunities um, in Chesterfield for kids to learn not just uh, what they'll need to do to succeed in college if that's what they choose, but what they can do for the workforce if they decide maybe they want to be an electrician uh, or a brick mason. We've actually had uh, the brick masons that have come into Chesterfield and asked to partner with us, and we've done nothing with that. Um, we need to give students every opportunity to explore what possible careers they could have. Um, not everybody is going to go to college. And I think, you know, my generation, our parents pushed us to college. It was something that was expected. You finished high school, what college are you going to? Uh, I have a, a relative who got his degree in business management, and now he is an electrician. And he's carrying the forty to $50,000 in debt that he's not going to use. Uh, so we need to make sure that we're working with our kids to help them explore the educational opportunities that excite them. And get them involved early. So if they decide in their freshman year, no, I thought that's what I wanted to do, it's not, it's not too late for them to change directions. Eric Rufus. I think that all of the children should be exposed to every option, but I would like to piggyback on what Ryan said. You know, the children who really need the tech the technical center or, or would be most at risk of not going to college aren't able to get into the technical center. And then if they are accepted into the technical center, if their parents can't afford the fees for the uniforms and the kits, which can go upward of $700, the kids can't participate. So we need to look at the equity there and figure out how we can support the families. We need to involve the community and bring in some resources for families if we can't provide finances and grants for family, for children to participate. Thanks very much. Does anyone want to use their wild card on this question? Yeah. So the company that I work for, ITAG, um, it has the uh, professional career paths as well as uh, trade career paths. And so I see on a daily basis how important it is um, that we foster and we um, show our children the options that are out there are available to them. Um, the company ITech that I work for offers a summer program for high school students um, to come and ex explore the idea of engineering. Um, so I work you know, very closely with um, both sides of um, the different career paths that are available. So it's very important that we educate our students as well as our parents all the options that are out there and get some company involvement as well to help um, show what is available out there to our students. Thank you. Anyone else want to check? <clears throat> Uh, being an educator, especially at the uh, higher education level, I think it's important that we allow students uh, to choose which path they decide to go, whether they want to go to college or whether they want to get a, um, a vocational trade. But some of the things that occurred when I was growing up that I think we need to implement back in the schools is the college tours. We need to do a career assessment inventory as early as the eighth grade because that's when kids begin to develop their interests and their cognitive ability. We need to do more career days so that they can understand the different careers that's available. We need to do workplace tours. We need to have companies come in and we need to have our kids go to places also. And one of the things that's very important and significant with me is when we take a kid to our job day so that our kids can be exposed to what we do. And I think those things will allow us the opportunity to help our children make better decisions in their career choices. Anyone else have a lot of questions? Um, my husband's in the trades, and I hear constantly how they have a difficult time trying to find electricians and tradesmen who make a lot of money. And we need to change the stigma that's attached to today's education world that if you don't go to college, you're viewed as a failure. And that actually begins in elementary school. And when uh, Dr. McCall talked about career days. We have career days in, in middle school. We have huge career fairs in middle school. And they're exposed to lots of careers. But I can re remember very few tradesmen that come in on career day. 
career day is full of the doctors and lawyers and dentists and professional careers. We don't expose our children to all of the traits that are available. And I can tell you, they can make some money without the college debt. So we need to work on changing that stigma of not going to college. And that will give our children a lot more opportunities. Our next question will begin with Bermuda and Ann Coker, and then go to Dale and Midlothian. Equity is a stated goal of the CCPS, whereas equality means treating everyone equally. Equity refers to giving every student what he or she needs to succeed by allocating additional resources to students facing disadvantages due to factors like race, language barrier, gender, disability, or socioeconomic status. As a school board member, what changes would you make to improve equity in our school system? Equity is a very important um, issue that we need to make sure that all of our children, again, no matter race, religion, sex, so forth, um, that they are getting the exact same quality education um, across the board. Um, it is important that we are um, aware of uh, what our students' needs are. Um, our kids learn at different levels. Um, it's not based on any physical attribute. It's typically based on um, a learning attribute. And so we need to make sure that we are understanding how our children learn. Um, being a mom of four children, all four of mine learn very differently. Um, so I have some that excel and don't need mom's help, and I have others that, that definitely do. Um, so again, it's about making sure that we are um, teaching to our students and teaching um, across the board equally. Will Harris? <laughs> Simply, I think that um, the first step we need to take is doing a personal inventory of our schools and making sure that we are providing as many programs as possible throughout the county to each and every school. I think um, we do a great disservice to ourselves when we do things, um, like I mentioned earlier, there's no CBG program in the Bermuda district. And that is inequitable because if, you know, it's a single parent household and mom has three kids and cannot afford to pick up their child after, um, for after school activities, and there isn't a bus that runs for after school activities three hours late, um, mom will ultimately say, you know, I can't send you to this, this program that will ultimately help you in the long run, but because I can't, or have the time to get you back and forth. If we're taking an inventory of our schools and seeing what we can do to offer as much as possible for every student, we will help close that gap when it comes to uh, education in Chester County. Thank you. Debbie Bailey. Equity encompasses so many different levels of conversation. Everything from the child in a wheelchair that can't play on the playground because it's not an accessible playground, to the child who can't pay for the SAT because it costs $60 and their family does not have those funds. One of the things Dr. Dory just instituted was paying for the PSAT and SAT, which was to a tune of about $185,000 out of the budget, which was unfunded. They didn't fund it. And that would have been a game changer um, for a lot of students who don't take the SAT because they don't have the money. He went out and actually had in hand and begged for money through from the Chesterfield Education Foundation and got it funded for this year. But that's it. It's not in the budget for the next year after. We have so many different areas that we can address equity, and one of them is just an intra-district funding. We have a school in Chesterfield County whose school fundraiser raised four hundred thousand dollars, and another school that raised four hundred dollars. So you. there's a lot of inequity in the district. Sugar Paul, just looking at educational equity, um, looking at a measurement of achievement, treating people fair, um, just giving everybody fair opportunities across the board. That's definitely some of the things that we need to look at. We need to have more minorities and women in administrative positions. We need to do culturally sensitivity training so that people can understand the cultures of different people. And I think that would help them as far as equity and diversity. And I think that we need to 
look at our school systems, how they make up and make sure that our administration and teachers are made up of that population also, so that people can be able to effectively communicate with each other. And I think that once you build that relationship and people are effectively able to communicate with people, then you develop equity. But equity is definitely a big thing, and diversity is definitely a big thing, and we definitely need that in Chesterfield County. Catherine Haynes. First of all, your, your zip code and the mean should not determine the resources that your school has. I think we should start by sharing the data because I think most constituents are not aware of the discrepancy between schools. Second, we need to send the message that we all truly benefit when everybody has greater access. I heard uh, the word uh, disadvantaged kids in the question, um, and this sends the message that only a certain uh, group of people benefit, but when everybody has access, we all benefit. Uh, a quick example, um, I went to the Metropolitan Educational Research Consortium uh, uh, conference at BCU uh, this past week, and uh, I happened to sit in, it was not planned on a presentation, uh, that was led by uh, Sean Abel, who's the uh, principal of Indian High School. And he changed, when there was you no know, racial or uh, economic diversity related to the pain, he put in more access because only half the population uh, were taking AP uh, high-level classes. Uh, now, when we're listening, the population is more diverse, and everybody has access to these classes. Dr. Green. Thank you. Uh, this is an issue that I frequently talk about in my household because my wife is a fifth grade teacher at one of the highest percentage free or reduced lunch schools in the county, and it's in the book, it's Chalky Elementary. And for me, this isn't an issue about, about budget or doing something better from the top. This is about listening to our teachers. Our teachers have the best ideas about how to handle equity in the classroom. Maybe they want to be a cell teacher, not a promo for the third grade. Maybe they want to do our teacher meetings on the weekends or at night time. Sometime when working parents can make it not on a Tuesday before Thanksgiving. We need real solutions like home visits and things that our teachers come up with. These are things that actually handle equity issues. And it's not driven by the board, it's driven by our teachers. Does anyone want to use their wild card for this? So when we look at equity, we can look at it from a macro view and a micro view. So when we look at it from a, a bird's eye view, just last week, I applaud the um, Virginia Board of Education for passing the equity add-on. That's going to supplement the state funding uh, for our county uh, for students who are receiving um, special education services and English language learners. It will also account for um, economic uh, hardships that our students are facing. Um, but then when we go down to a micro level, and we're talking at the school level, and we're talking about the classroom, and we're talking about the teachers, um, we have got to look, talk about the, distri the distribution and the number of SROs that are put into our schools and where those schools have higher concentrations of or higher numbers of SROs um, and what those, what those students look like. Um, and then we can talk about things like playgrounds, where uh, we can talk about playgrounds, something as easy as that, where our county now, what we do is we drop a playground into a building. Okay, and then we need to get playgrounds for everybody, not just one. Okay, we're now going to go to the three questions of the lightning round. And I'm going to start with Justin Smith and go around this way. Go to Justin, Erica, and then we're going to, we're going to come around this way. Uh, 15 seconds or less. Despite research that shows that teenagers fare better academically than later school start times, there are many parents who didn't support and still don't support the changes implemented a year ago. Would you support altering or rolling back the school start time changes? If rolling it back, then we could get our kids to school on time and home on time for solving a transportation issue, yes. Eric? Yes. Um, as I said before, um, I support policies that are made with the community, not at the community. So this would be another discussion that we would open up. And? Um, I agree that we need to open this up to the community and actually let's take a, a look and do a checkup of what this uh, changes in instituting. I think we need more information and more data driven uh, knowledge on as to what we've done uh, and go from there. <coughs> we need school start times based on getting our kids to school. I don't believe a ninth grader sleeping in his education is any more important than my eighth grader's education. We need real solutions. <coughs> 
Data driven would be to include uh, middle school, um, but also adolescents as well as high school. So we need to look at that as a former practicing midwife. Uh, sleep is critical to mental health. Yes, I would support going back to the original school start time. That's what got us in the predicament or part of the problem. I think the parents have spoken. And um, I think when we change the, to add to the transportation issues, that was not a right decision to change uh, the school start time to where we are now. And that's been part, right. part of the problem. Um, many parents and teachers were not necessarily happy with changing the school start times. I would say the majority of people were against it. Um, and as a parent of someone that sees their children on the door at, at 6.35 in the morning, um, if the community overwhelmingly wanted to change those start times, I would support it. I like evidence-based research and definitely bring the community in and see what they think and uh, put it all together and then we'll make a decision based on that. Yeah. I think they changed the school start times and did not have the funds to support it, and that's why we're in the bus situation that we are and added additional routes. I would support going back to the original start times. Thank you. Okay, the next next question is going to start with Catherine. We're going to go around this way. Uh, Legionella scare earlier this summer has led to a conversation about who should manage facility maintenance, the county or the school system. Is it time for the school system to see facility maintenance to the county government? Um, so the school system is large, uh, 8,000 employees, uh, about 70 buildings, and county uh, is a lot smaller. So it's a little bit like a Walmart going to CVS and saying, can you help me with your problems? So I think we need to be careful. This conversation needs to be between the new school board and the new board of supervisors, and together we will work out a plan that serves everyone. I don't see it as an issue of who's better us or that. It's a matter of contract management. We need to know who's going to be able to manage the actual contractors doing the job, hold them accountable, and make sure it's done right. Will? I think the county should be managing it, and I think that we will be able to hold it accountable. I don't know what our names are on it, and I would be willing to do that. And? I think the new school board and our uh, new board of supervisors uh, should work together to come up with a plan to make sure that um, this issue, situation does not happen again um, and that, uh, that, they, that whoever is in charge of this is held accountable for what is um, the maintenance of our needs out there. Sorry. Um, I think that the schools should handle the maintenance of our buildings, um, and I think that it's time for the county to fund our maintenance needs properly um, at 2.5 of the uh, assessed value of the buildings. Eric? I think it comes down to accountability and competence, and well, between the school, school board and the board of supervisors, I think it can be done. Justin, uh, I would not be inclined to hand it over. You're asking the school board who has one priority, and that is our school facilities, to hand it over to someone who now has competing priorities. And if the school maintenance is not the number one priority, I would be remiss to hand it over to them. Yeah. If the way we turned over our grounds and our custodial service, which have both been outsourced, is any indication, I do not believe we should turn it over. We should take care of our own homes. Sure, sure. I think that the next uh, school board and the uh, board of supervisors should work together and make sure that we hold people accountable and make sure that they do the things that they're responsible to do. Um, I think that it's important that we take a look at the contract and if the county were to take over, we really need to see how that would actually play out and if it's even viable. If we just rush to judgment and we make a hate decision, we end up getting you know, in ourselves in trouble, just like we have with transportation issues. So I would want more data on I strongly feel as though that the new school board and board of supervisors need to work collaboratively together to make the best decisions that are in the best interest of our students and our families and our community. I think we, well, I know there should be competent people who are making also those decisions on an administrative level. Thank you. Hold on to the mic. Uh, we're going to start with you on the third question, and we're going to go this way. <laughs> 
Uh, the current school board decided to withdraw from participation alongside the Board of Supervisors in the Joint Audit and Finance Committee. Do you think the school system should maintain its own audit committee or return to the Joint Committee? Can you repeat your question? Sure. The current school board decided to withdraw from participation alongside the Board of Supervisors in the Joint Audit and Finance Committee. Do you think the school system should return to the joint committee or simply retain its own audit committee? I feel as though that uh, the committee should uh, be able to work collaboratively. Um, we should be a group of uh, experienced, knowledgeable, professional or individuals who should be the, who would make the best decisions. However, if that cannot be done, then it can be taken care of or rendered by an outside party. Okay. I have a certificate and conflict resolution. And so I always will be approaching this from resolving conflict. We should return and we should address uh, the reasons that the board's the school board felt the need to leave uh, so that we can move forward together. Patrick? Yes, we absolutely need to. As a trial attorney who advocates for my clients, I believe we need to advocate with those board of supervisors for our needs. We're not going to run for the problem. We're going to sit there and argue over the our points. Will? Um, a big part of my platform is having uh, open uh, dialogue with the board of supervisors. If we're not going to get anything done collaboratively, if we are not working together, um, I think it is super important that we do rejoin and then work together. And. I think I mentioned before that it's very important that um, you know, the board of supervisors and the school board work together um, as far as making the decision whether to return or uh, keep the audit separate. I would like to know more information as to why it was separated to begin with by the first school. Uh, um, a large part of my platform is to bring more transparency to our school board process. So um, I would absolutely support having a dialogue about having uh, bringing that um, committee back together. Perfect. I would definitely support um, working together with the Board of Supervisors so that we have more oversight and it's more transparent. Justin? I'm in favor of anything that brings more transparency to government at all. Debbie? Mm -hmm. I would echo that, and I think that it's imperative that the Board of Supervisors and the school board work together. Um, th this is all county dollars. It's not the Board of Supervisors dollars. It's Chesterfield citizens dollars. And we need to work together in an audit and in every way. I definitely agree and concur with everybody that we definitely need to work together and um, come up with solutions together so that we can have transparency. So I'm for rejoining and working together. Right? And I also agree with everyone. We need to rejoin that audit process together. Um, it is important for the Board of Supervisors and the school board to work together to make sure we're all moving forward at the same time and at the same pace. Okay, great. Ryan, hold on to the, to the mic. We're going to go this way around uh, now. And this is uh, a question for 30 seconds. Okay. Everybody gets 30 seconds for this question. Redistricting. In 2015, the school board commissioned a consultant to study and recommended a plan for countywide redistricting to address overcrowding in schools and excess capacity at others. In 2016, however, the broader redistricting plan was abandoned. It was deemed too disruptive to families. Would you support comprehensive countywide redistricting? Well, in my district, uh, Cosby High School is at 120%. Um, we also have uh, Tomahawk Creek is at 120%. Um, we are popular elementary schools at over 120%. So something has to be done. And we have to revisit the idea to redistrict. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a large scale thing, but we need to see how we're able to adjust these districts um, so that we're able to take the overcrowding in some of these classrooms um, and to bring down the student uh, to teacher ratios. Cedric. There definitely, there definitely is a. Uh, some issues with schools uh, being overcrowded. We know that I'm not one of those individuals that jump to big changes. So I would have to look at the evidence based uh, literature and see what's going on. And we work together. And if uh, collectively as a board, we come up with 
that there needed to be redistricting, then we would look at that at that time to make a decision. Okay. In my district, Falling Creek Middle School is 123% over capacity and has 22 trailers. Meadowbrook High School is over capacity, but there's 500 empty seats at L.C. Burke. There are empty seats in other schools around the county. We need to be good stewards of our resources, and that includes our buildings. And it's kind of unconscionable to ask the taxpayers to pay for more schools when we have empty seats because we're too afraid to redistrict. We need to redistrict. Justin. Redistricting is something that should be done sparingly, but I think um, to do that at least once during our tenure would be a good idea for several reasons. One is going to help with overcrowding. The other one is you have Title One funds that are um, being spread out among uh, several different schools. If by redistricting, we can do those number of students that would fall into that uh, poverty level, and then reduce the number of Title One schools that we have. That money then goes to the schools that need it uh, versus having it in. in spread out because those funds don't expand based on more schools it's a finite amount erica i believe that we definitely need to district as we know that most of our schools are overcrowded but i do think we have to consider how it affects the children families yes but the children because our schools need to be child-centered and so we need to look at really look at data and see how how it's worked and what we need to change John? Um, I think that redistricting is a conversation that we can have if it's done carefully, thoughtfully, and equitably. Um, I think that we need to be mindful that we are not uh, segregating our schools based on low-income students. Um, and I also think that we can't continue to push the peas around our plate and pretend we ate the vegetables. Eventually, we're going to have to build these schools we need. We need two middle schools at least, and we need one high school built. Yeah. Redistricting is a hard topic. Um, being in the Bermuda district, we just went through this um, with the elementary school with the building of Enon Elementary. So I know as a parent how hard it is to uh, hear that word um, for redistricting, but we need to be mindful of the overcrowding and the, uh, the population within our schools. Um, we also need to keep in mind the neighborhoods um, as far as where our kids do they play with on a daily basis to make sure that we're keeping the neighborhood and just retaining our Will. Sorry. Um, I think the board has been incredibly uh, reactionary as opposed, as opposed to being proactive. Um, I think having a very, uh, having a hard conversation with them about where the developments are going in our, in our county is, is extremely important. If we're not finding out about developments until after the fact and we're not accounting for that when it comes to us building schools, um, we're doing a great disservice to the people who live here. I think it's important that um, <coughs> we uh, make sure the redistricting is the last possible thing that we do before anything uh, else. Patrick. People buy homes because of the school district they're in. There's no secret about that. We need to make sure that we have long term plans in place so people aren't surprised by a school being redistributed the next year. That's not fair to them, it's not fair to the students. I want to look at other options so we don't have to be district because I don't believe it's fair for people to buy, that, buy those homes. That means we need to look at ways of moving specialty centers, CPG programs. Our kids are already choosing to go to another school for a specific program. Move the program to schools that have room. That's the first step. And then we need to look at a long term plan. We are way too reactionary, as Will said. We need a five, ten year plan. Okay. Uh, the redistricting study that you mentioned actually. Uh, mentioned that we should uh, look at kids that are being out of uh, bus out of district and so that is something that absolutely would like to do as well um, and be better at long-term planning and use uh, gis evidence-based non-political strategies i have said that i will not take redistricting off the table for political reasons i will not shy away from that conversation that said i think the idea that redistricting is going to solve our, our elementary school crowding problems uh, after having looked at enrollment um, I don't think that's the case. Commission. Yes, prior to CCPS uh, considering redistricting, we need to first carefully access, access community demographics. We also need to research into the types of pro programs that would appeal to diverse families and give attention to the roles of transportation and the changing residential patterns in the area. Um, these mentioned require discussion and planning prior to the development of a comprehensive, con con 
countywide redistricting plan and with a desire to improve educational equity and achievement through uh, sub-economic uh, sub integration. Thank you. So we're going to start now with Dot, and we're going to go down your way and come around here. And here's the question, another 30-second question. While local teachers have received relatively small pay increases over the past few years, these pay increases tend to benefit recently hired teachers. Meanwhile, the salaries of veteran teachers do not increase at the same rate. How do we provide incentives to keep our veteran teachers from seeking employment elsewhere? Well, we need to uh, reevaluate that salary scale. Um, that we are losing uh, veteran teachers, qualified teachers, and experienced teachers to other divisions because a lateral move to Henrico is more beneficial than staying where you are. Is um, it, it, that is detrimental to our whole community. Um, and uh, as far as as you know, pay increases, absolutely, I can <coughs> support the. Um, proposed 5%, additional 5% pay increase for our teachers. Um, and I do um, support increasing teachers' pay. I think it's important for us to keep our um, qualified um, teachers here in Chesterfield County. Um, and our veteran teachers are, are most, not most important, but they're, they're seasoned. They know they've worked with all the students over many years. Um, so it's important that we um, make sure that their salary increases are um, keeping them here and we keep the quality and um, maintain our, our teacher staff here at Chesterfield County. Will. Uh, 30 seconds. Ooh. Um, the, we talk about teacher pay increases and 5% is great, but we need to make sure we're doing everything in our power to make sure that those 5% increases are not mitigated by health care increases and other things that and, uh, take a teacher's salary back from them. Providing more resources in the classroom um, is crucial because you can't give them a 5% raise and then also tell them they need to provide all the paper and income for the entire year. Every two weeks my wife gets her paycheck more to the willard because the feeling has been the same for the past five years she's been in this county. And lo and behold it has been because they change the scale every year. That's unconscionable. You should not have a sliding pay scale. You got hired in the corporate world and they told you that you were going to change your salary depending how our year is, you leave. That's what's happening. Teachers are leaving. We need to have a set pay scale. So when you step in day one, you know what your pay is in year 20, including any future raises that we're going to do. Our veteran teachers are our mentors. We don't have a teacher shortage problem in just a field. We have a teacher retention problem, and we can help fix our teacher retention problem by keeping our veteran teachers and doing a collaborative, uncovered uh, planning where our veteran teachers can help um, our newer teachers so that they stay. And absolutely, we have to raise the salary of all teachers, uh, including uh, veteran teachers of surrounding counties. Um, veteran teachers have higher pay. Yes, I value all of our teachers, and I value our veteran teachers. According to the National Education Association, Virginia's average teacher salary in 2017-18 was more than $9,000 below the national average. I am going to continue to advocate and fight for all of our teachers every year until we are bringing our teachers up to the national average. They play a very vital and intricate role in educating our children, and we need to make sure that we are doing our best, that we are, that they are being brought up and paid for what they are giving and offering our students on a daily basis. Right. Um, so as a teacher, I do know that the first couple of years teaching is kind of the honeymoon phase, and then it kind of wears off. And the one thing that would probably keep a lot of teachers there is if there was a steady step in your pay, and that there's not. We have, a, we have nice sums of money in the beginning to attract young teachers, but you're right. The seasoned teachers, up to about 20 years, you're not, not receiving much more than $100 to $200 more per year as a step. We need to make sure that we're paying our teachers more, advocating for more money, and make sure that we go ahead and, and restructure those pay steps. Sure. I, definitely am, uh, in, I definitely think that we need to increase teachers' pay. 
Uh, we deal with this also at the college level, that some of the newer teachers come in, professors, and they make more than some of the more seasoned professors. So I definitely think that we need some kind of step or some kind of uh, uh, evaluation process for their pay so that the seasoned teachers can, t can, t can continue to make money and do a better job and definitely lead up to the national average. Definitely. A brand new teacher in Chesterfield County earns $45,872. 15 years later, she earns $49,000. I would definitely support a stepped salary index scale that rewards longevity, that gets the teacher to the higher end of the scale quicker. We need to decrease the steps. We need to actually have a step scale. We don't even have that. When I first started teaching 34 years ago, we had a step scale. But then recession comes, they did away with it. That's good. Uh, here we have a teacher shortage. I think that can be boiled down even more to we have a shortage of professional level master's degree employees who are willing to work between forty and fifty thousand dollars a year. Uh, that's uncomfortable. You're not going to find that in almost anywhere else in the workforce. Um, we need to make sure that that compression that exists now with teacher salaries isn't something that causes them to leave. Uh, we need to make sure that we're at least keeping up with the cost of living. When you're making less real money after being in the school system for 15 years, there's, uh, there's no reason or no wonder why teachers are leaving. Erica? Um, I agree with everyone on the panel. You definitely need to pay our teachers more. 5% is not enough. 10% really wouldn't be enough. But I do think we need to have performance incentives. Our veteran teachers are important. But we need to be sure that they are being able to keep up with the change in our community because our community has changed, the diversity has changed, and so we need teachers who are are competent and are capable of working with the students in the way they are now. Thank you. I'm going to start with a 30 second question now with Shedrick and go around this way. <coughs> it's a question that deals with the implications of some changing one changing demographic in general. As recently as 2000, two thirds of Chesterfield households had school aged children. That number is about one third, which means there are more households in the county that aren't directly invested in our schools. Does the school system need to do more to connect with the broader community, including those families without school aged children? Yeah, most definitely. I think that uh, there needs to be some communication, some forms, some panels, um, so that we can get the community and the school connected. So I think that's definitely something that we need to do. And I think that um, we need to keep, we need to make sure that our people in the community are definitely involved in the school systems and know what's going on because that definitely affects them and their, how their property value, different things like that. So we definitely need that communication. I'm definitely uh, for that and I believe in relationships and transparency and those things will help us do better. Thank you. Ryan. Um, it, it is very important that everybody still stays engaged, and I believe that it's right around 33.7% or something like, uh, to that nature of uh, the number of households that have school aged children. But some of those homes have four or five children. Um, so it is important to kind of take a look at that and see that it, it really could be a little bit more than just the 33%. However, for the taxpayers, it is important for them to see that we are being good stewards of their money and that. Being good stewards of the money, having a good school system, does protect property values. I think it is uh, uh, important that we, as a board, as a board member, that we are continuously connected with the community, that we are engaging them, and that we are also uh, asking for their input and decisions. Um, we are is only as good as our community's uh, input and their buy-in on a lot of decisions that are made with their tax dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we need to uh, change how we talk about the problem. Instead of saying that only a third of our taxpayers have kids and public schools, we need to talk about how we have a stronger democracy when everyone gets a great first class education. At the Metropolitan Education Resource Consortium co uh, Conference, they talked about 
uh, the education problem as a national security issue. We need to talk about when we go into the emergency room in the hospital, do we want a, a staff of well-trained doctors? Do we want electricians? That's a conversation. Patrick. We have a crisis of confidence issue in our school system right now. That's the biggest issue I'm hearing when I talk to people in the community that don't have kids in the schools. You hear about Legionella, you hear about bus issues, you hear about maintenance issues. They need to know that they can trust us with the funds they give us as taxpayers. And as a traveler who advocates on a daily basis, I'm going to advocate based on the actual needs of our schools, advocate with those people in the community. And that's why I'm proud that I was endorsed by the Richmond Realtors Association, because I understand the issues, not just the schools, but the, of the community that's funding our schools. Will. Um, education, this specifically just for county, but um, across the nation, directly affects the community that is involved. Um, when our schools do well, our property values are high, et cetera, et cetera. But we, when we look at the tax dollars, we spend just barely over $33,000 a year per incarcerated individual in Virginia. We spend less than $11,000 per student in public schools in Virginia. We are not showing the taxpayers currently that we are willing to spend their money uh, responsibly by, by not investing in our parents' futures. Again? Um, I concur with um, the panel up here that we need to engage our community, we need to engage our taxpayers so that they understand how the school board is spending their money and that we're spending, we would be spending it wisely. Um, all taxpayers, regardless of you know, students or kids in the school system or not, um, our vested interest in the community, and it's important that we um, make sure that everyone is informed, um, and that we can maybe do that through engaging the workforce as another option of engaging the community. Don? Um, I agree. We need to inform and educate um, all of our community about the value of our public schools. Um, and I agree with Catherine, an educated community benefits everyone in our community. A well-educated community is what we want. We want teachers who can who know how to teach. We want doctors who know how to heal. Um, and I also was endorsed by the Richmond Association of Realtors because I understand that home values are tied to school quality. And the more quality schools that we have, better, the better off we will all be. I believe that community engagement is paramount. When we look at the resources uh, or the lack there of resources, we have a robust community. We need to bring the community into our schools more. It would, it would definitely close the gap and it may even help with our achievement gap. Justin. Um, having great schools in Chesterfield is something that increases everyone's property value. It's the reason people move to Chesterfield in specific districts. Uh, when my wife and I bought our first house, we moved to, uh, the first thing we looked at were schools. Um, so for, you know, for every five points, test scores go up, property values increase 2.5%. There is a value there for everybody. And when our children are well-educated, the community does better as a result. Okay. So not just to pair at everyone else, I'll tell you a story. Um, I've knocked over 4,000 doors, and I can tell you, I know there are 65% of the people in Chesterfield County that don't have children in school, because I've heard that a lot at the doors, but I've run into a lot of elderly people who we need to get creative and involving in our school system, because when we connect with them and bring them into our schools to work with our students, they're going to be more supportive in the long run. I have some really good ideas. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have, a, we have a question from the audience that we want to put forward before we get to your final statements. And that is this. Um, how should Chesterfield County, I'm start with Patrick, and go around to Will next. Um, how should Chesterfield County invest in early childhood education for all children to prepare them for school, the workforce, and to be productive members of uh, this community? This is something that I think is, will have the biggest impact on our education system. If you've heard about the four million word project ideas that a child living in poverty is in your four million plus words in a kid that's not in poverty. That means they're already coming to school, hearing less words, not being able to articulate themselves. We need early childhood education to get those kids into the school system so they can be ready to be part of our school system. It's about priorities like everything else. I think that is something that can be prioritized and have a real difference long term, not just in that year for that kid in early childhood education. Will. We know for a fact that early childhood education helps
helps identify parameters that may uh, inhibit them from learning uh, productively. I did not realize I had a learning disability until I was a senior in high school, and at that point I was told, I'm so sorry, there's nothing more we can do to graduate in two months. Had there been an opportunity for me uh, to be uh, educated earlier, there's more of a chance that that disability would be caught. Um, and I think that access is something that should be stretched across the entire county. And yeah, I, I agree as well that early education, the sooner we can get um, in education in front of our, our young, our youth, the uh, better off um, our students will be, the more confident they will be going into school, and the better that they will succeed um, in their education career. So I would love to see what programs we can implement to increase uh, early childhood education. Right. Um, and I support our early childhood education program and expanding that um, to include even more students. Um, I, I think we also need to look at our communication with families and um, educate families to know that these programs are available. Um, Chesterfield County had open seats in our Head Start program this year, and that was money that was just uh, federal funds that weren't used. We're leaving money on the table and leaving children behind. Erica. Um, I received my early childhood education certificate from this, this campus, this school, um, John Tower. Um, early education, the expansion, expansion of it is a part of my platform. I believe that early education is paramount to breaking down that school to prison pipeline. It cuts out some of the discipline issues because children have adjusted to the school <coughs> a little sooner. Parents have adjusted to getting their children ready for school and, and participating a little sooner, and it helps. Okay, Justin. Um, early childhood education, I mean, there's no disagreement up here. The studies show that your child does, does better the earlier that they are in school. So if we can get the kids in there pre K, um, you're there, you've got an extra year before you're getting into the top curriculums, and you're just going to do better overall. And, our job as school board is to make sure our kids are getting the best education possible. Gary? Yeah. I have a girlfriend that works in the Head Start program in Chesterfield County, and I can tell you it's an amazing program. And I like the most bang for your buck it's in the preschool programs. Children entering kindergarten way behind the curve. Some children walk in already reading, and other children can't even identify colors. And it's a huge disparity. That can be fixed with early childhood education. Put your funds in that, and you'll see tremendous improvement. Sure. As a, a counseling psychologist, we know that early education increased social skills. We know that there's a correlation with an increase in aptitude and a decrease in special educational services. We know that it also increases their attention span. And the most importantly is that we know that when kids start school early, they have an enthusiasm for lifelong learning. And family, there's definitely a correlation with going to school early and going to college. So we definitely need to look at these things. Brian? Um, I believe that early childhood education is important. And I think that we need to do a better job as a county to get the information out to people and make them aware that we do have things like Head Start and some information and the receipts that run through this year. Um, we need to also look to make sure that we advocate for additional funds to make sure that we can implement this in all areas of the county and not just in certain areas. Demisha? Early intervention services are imperative to the development of the academic growth of a child. Um, I think it um, is uh, disheartening to know that um, I know one of the schools in my district, we have a group of volunteers who have actually um, developed a program in which they have to solicit for donations. That should not be the case. But your Title I schools, you have funds that are available for early intervention services. It is the board that should be making decisions to allocate the funds, and that is what I'm going to do. And it is a part of my platform. Catherine. I'm also going to say, because uh, I'm an evidence-based girl, uh, that we need to invest in pre-K. Uh, that said, it's a huge funding issue. And the school board does not control the purse strings. So really, uh, this is an issue that is going to be decided the polls on November 5th. 
vote and vote for board of supervisors candidates that are going to support uh, increased funding for our schools because there's a big uh, price tag that comes with uh, adding a pre-k pre program. We also need to look at the new school prototype. I don't think it includes space for pre-k. Thank you. We're now going to go to your, your final statement. I'm going to start on this side of the room and come this way. We'll start with Bill. Hello again. 60 seconds. Um, I just wanted to take this time to say that we're just over a week out from the election, and I've seen so many people work tirelessly and, and for long days and long hours. Um, I hope that I've given you an opportunity to learn a little bit more about me, um, but I guess we will see what happens from the government. Thank you. Ann. Thank you all for allowing us to share our stories and the reasons why we're running for the school board. I believe the school board is a wonderful <coughs> team, communicates well, and is supportive of each other. That an effective school board is made up of a variety of backgrounds and education, and that but we all have one common goal, and that's to do the best for the students. I believe uh, effective school board members are, have a love of service, that they have a desire to listen, and they want to achieve results. And those are qualities that I bring to the school board, and I have worked very hard over these past uh, 10, almost 11 months, um, getting my message out there, and I hope to have your support and votes on November 5th. Can't believe we're almost there. Um, so uh, again, thank you for your time this evening, and thank you very much. Um, so, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you again for hosting. Um, I am bringing 10 years of education advocacy to this position, as well as nearly a lifetime of public service. Um, this is my first time running for any public office because this is where my passion is. Um, this is evidenced by my service and my career. Uh, I hope to have the opportunity to serve on the school board and to continue that service to our community. Thanks. Eric? I would just like to say I appreciate everyone for coming out this evening. Um, we have a big opportunity. We have a chance to change the way things have been done. And not to say that everything has been done wrong, but there is room for opportunity. And so I just say make your choices wisely. If you have any questions for me, please reach out to me. I am available um, by email, phone, message any way that you have all of my information is out on the table um so if you have any questions and you don't catch me after please reach out to me justin hey justin smith again I'm, I'm running because i think my background best fits this position this isn't a stepping stone position for me i'm not looking to run for higher office after this education is something that's very important to me it's very important to my family and my mom was a teacher. I've donated over the last you know, six, seven years, many, many hours and weekends and personal time taken off from work for the Center for Civic Education, where we teach kids constitutional law and how to get involved at the civic level. Uh, this is something that I'm not just running because um, I believe my background uh, gives me the um, best experiences to pull from for this position, but it's something that I've lived and it's something that I've taught kids in high school uh, in different areas to do, and I'm living what I'm teaching, and I, I really hope to be able to bring that experience and increase transportation efficiencies and uh, help with providing equal access to education <coughs> opportunities for our children. Yeah. After dedicating 34 years to the education of the students in Chesterfield County, serving on the school board seemed like the logical next step in my commitment to the young people in Chesterfield. To understand my sincere desire to help our youth, you have to look no farther than the after-school program I started in a community in need. I started the Broadwater Learning Center in 2012 to assist a community of at-risk youth. That program, I'm proud to say, still exists today. I also have the most institutional knowledge of Chesterfield County Schools I've been a teacher, department chair, PBL liaison, team leader, chair of countless committees, and I understand the school system's programs, its processes, and its procedures. I would bring a career teacher's voice to the school board, and I think it's time we have a career teacher on the school board that will put our students first. Sure. 
Uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be here tonight and just to talk to you all. Uh, I bring 25 years of educational experience in higher education. Um, I've been in Chesterfield County basically all my life. Uh, I've coached in Chesterfield County, coached many of your kids, I've counseled many of your kids, I've mentored many of your kids. Um, I've been a very effective uh, person in Chesterfield County. I think that if you want somebody in your school board that cares about the children, cares about the community, I am that person. Along with that, um, I just love our children. I also had a child graduate from the school, and I have a daughter that will attend uh, Chesterfield School, so I have a very invested interest in Chesterfield County. And I just want to say, if you want a person that's going to work hard, do their best, then I'm that person. And I pray that you all get on and vote for me on November the 5th. Thank you so much. Ryan? Well, just like everyone else said, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out this evening. Um, after serving 12 years in the United States Air Force, um, serving around the world in about four different countries, and then coming back and filling needs in our schools as a civics and economics teacher, I've always been the type of person that you see a need, you feel a need. And this is one of those times again. All five members were leaving the school board. And I think that's important that you have advocates and leaders on the school board that are willing to ask the tough questions and make the difficult decisions. We need to make sure that we are taking care of our students. We need to make sure that we are taking care of our parents, our educators, our paraprofessionals, bus drivers, and finally our community. Everyone needs to be on board. We need to be inclusive. We need to bring everyone together. And together we can make the school system that's already great a lot better. Venetia. Thank you for uh, allowing me to have this opportunity to speak before the people. Dedicating uh, much of my volunteering to schools and community involvement for more than 15 years and the need for diversity are the reasons that I am running. I am not seeking a higher platform. I have been doing the work. I have been in the trenches. I have served. I have advocated on behalf of students, on behalf of teachers. Uh, I have served, uh, advocated on behalf of families. One thing I have realized in my canvassing is that amongst various groups, regardless of your political affiliation, we have more in common than we do uncommon. I am able to relate to people on all levels, and that is very important. When I mount that board, it is not about politics. It is about the people. That is who I am, and that is what I stand for. Serving in your community not only um, served in the, the Chesterfield County's Equity Committee, and I am also endorsed by the Richmond Association of Realtors, but I represent all people. I am the one who is going to ask the hard to ask questions, and I am going to be driven in order to improve and make our schools the better. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I am not a politician. I've never held party office. I am a mom. We have 62,000 kids in the Chesterfield County Public School System, and we are receiving less funding after adjusting for inflation than we did post-recession. We have five part-time school board members, and most counties of our size, we have better representation on the school board in terms of the uh, number of members, and we have at-large members. Do I wish we had more members? Yes, but I'm an Army rat, and I'm used to rolling up my sleeves and working with what I have. So this is what I can offer you. I will make this uh, representative my sole career focus for the next four years so I can not only really represent you and be in schools during the day listening to teachers, I would just feel Education Association endorsed, and listening to principals and listening to staff and at the bus stops, but also at the board of supervisors, gaining back trust, building relationships, and in the General Assembly advocating for more funding. We need more funding. We can do it together. Patrick. Thank you for this opportunity. Also, the question before you is going to be, who's going to have the right priorities and who's going to be able to make the tough decisions? We all know what's best for our school system, but we're not going to get everything we need. You have to ask yourself, who's going to have that experience to handle those tough decisions? During the course of my career, I served in Iraq and Afghanistan where I advised military officers on life and death situations, but I was awarded two bronze stars. I was also a U.S. Army paratrooper, Department of Defense ethics counselor. I was the legal advisor for military theaters drafting and reviewing thousands of policies, including the Army Logistics University down the road for the Commandant, reviewing academic and student code of conduct policies. In addition, I work from home. I'm an attorney that works from home. I put my kids on the bus in the morning, pick them up in the afternoon, 
when they show up on time. You need an unapologetic champion who's going to be here in the community based on real, relevant experience, and that's why I'm asking for your vote on November 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me just say a few words in uh, closing. First, as everyone has noted on here, thanks to everyone for coming out tonight or watching and streaming. Uh, very, very clear how important these issues are to the future of Chesterfield County. Uh, secondly, I always want to commend anyone who puts in this effort and time uh, to run for public office, and particularly the school system, because I think, as you heard tonight, for all of these people here, it's really a labor of love. So let's thank them for a wonderful day. Secondly, we are videotaping recording tonight, so we will have it live by the time the Observer goes online on Wednesday. So next Wednesday, it will be live. We'll all share it, all three organizations on our social media, so look for that. And you can share it with your community members and so forth. So again, thank you to our stars for the hour, the candidates that are vying for school board, and of course to our moderator, Bob Holstros. Have a good evening. Thank you.